Good evening. Welcome everyone to the Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Sciences, the largest institution in the United States devoted to the arts, sciences, and artists of movie making. The Academy Museum of Motion Pictures acknowledges the Tongva people as the traditional caretakers of the land and water on which we program, curate, educate, convene, and discuss. We honor and respect Tongva ancestors and the Tongva community today, which continue to nurture this land and water through traditional practice, activism, art, and education. We also acknowledge their continued work to safeguard cultural resources. My name is KJ Ralph Miller, and I'm the Director of Film Programs here at the museum. Thank you for joining us in our wonderful David Geffen Theater for the international feature film panel presented as part of our nominee programs. Nominee program support provided by Clarendell uh, and Domain Clarence Dillon, the Academy Museum of Motion Pictures official wines. Additional support for nominee programs provided by Delta Airlines. I would like to thank our ASL interpreters who will be assisting today. Their names are Timothy Lane and Felix Villarreal. <laughs> Nominee programs bring select screenings of Academy Award nominated shorts and panels with Academy Award nominated filmmakers in the lead up to the 96th Oscars to the Academy Museum for the Public. We have one final nominee program tomorrow here in this theater with nominees from the category of hair styling, uh, hair, makeup and hairstyling. And I've heard rumor that some special guests might be here. If you were here last year, you might know what's in store, but it's gonna be a fantastic program tomorrow here at 11 a.m. And on Oscar Sunday, you can join us here in this very theater to watch the 96th Academy Awards live on ABC. You can learn more and get your tickets at academymuseum.org. Before we begin our program, please silence, darken, and stow your mobile devices. And now, help me welcome to the stage Dilcia Barrera, Senior Vice President of Member Relations, Global Outreach, and Awards Administration at the Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Sciences. Good evening. On behalf of the International Feature Film Award Administration team, including Jose Gallegos and Esther Moon, and it's, it is my great honor to welcome you all tonight. The International Feature Film category was formerly the Foreign Language Film category, and it was initially created to honor a new wave of international productions that were undeniably beloved by American audiences. This category has evolved as global filmmaking has evolved, and today we're so proud of the international presence, not only in this category, but in all categories of the Oscars. International representation in the Oscars is a reflection of our global year-round work. Um, from impact programs to museum exhibitions and membership engagement, the Academy's love and respect for international cinema and its artists is palpable. This year, we received 88 submissions from six countries. Six continents, not countries. <laughs> many, many countries. For months, members across the world participated in watching, discussing, and voting to form this year's shortlist and nominees. We thank all the members that had joined to volunteer and opted in to watch and, wo and vote for their dedication and love for this category. We'd also like to thank the Executive Committee for their year-round guidance. The Executive Committee is a global group appointed by the committee co-chairs to oversee the rules and regulations of this category. This evening, it's our honor to have with us the International Feature Film Executive Committee co-chair, Rajendra Roy, joining us as host and moderator. In 2007, Raj joined the Museum of Modern Art as the Celeste Bartos Chief Curator of Film a role in which he leads MoMA's year-round initiatives to exhibit and preserve works from its collection of, of over 30,000 titles. In collaboration with colleagues at MoMA and partner institutions, he has organized numerous exhibitions, including retrospectives for Oscar nominees and winners, such as Julia Reichardt, Nan Goldwyn, Pedro Almodovar, Vin Benders, Tim Burton, and Mike Nichols. He's been an Academy member since 2017 and proudly serves on the National Film Preservation Board under the leadership of Academy Museum President Jacqueline Stewart. 
Our other co-chair, Susanna Beer, is unable to join us today, but she sends her love and appreciation, and we send it back to her, as I know she's watching from the live stream. Both Susanna and Raj are great partners, and we're so honored that we get to work with them year-round. Um, so now, please help me welcome to the stage Rajendra Roy. Guten Abend, Dobre Vietcher, Buonasera, Buon Sare, Naka Ngozi, Konbonwa, Buenas Noches, Good Evening. This is a celebration of international film, and those are the languages from the films we are honoring tonight. Welcome to you all, and good evening. As as Dilcia mentioned, the films nominated in this categories went from 88 submissions to a shortlist of 15 films to tonight's five nominees. Academy members across the globe have spent countless hours watching and voting on these films. Many of these dedicated members are here with us tonight or watching at home via the live stream. And if you are a voting member of the international feature film category, I would invite you to please stand and accept our applause. And stand at home, too, if you're watching. Thank you, dear colleagues, for your time, your commitment, and your work in making this evening possible. The international filmmakers who are here tonight uh, help tell stories that were not solely localized to their country or region of the world. And through their masterful storytelling, they remind us why this medium is so important. Germany studied a teacher of Polish origins caught in a tense incident at a school. Italy traversed multiple continents with two Senegalese teenagers seeking a new life. Japan, through the lens of a German filmmaker, honored the daily routine of a Japanese worker. Spain showed us a Uruguayan rugby team struggling to escape the Andes. And the United Kingdom observed a family building a bourgeois life with neighboring uh, a concentration camp. Let's take a look first at the five films nominated for Best International Feature Film. From Italy. Io Capitano, Matteo Garone, Director. Mi boy! Mi boy, you need them. You can do them. You can do them. Come. Boy, you need them, Italy boy. You can do them, thank you, boy. You can do them, hospital. You can do them, you can do them, you can do them, you can do them. You can do them, you can do them, boy, all this. Tu sei pronto, poi dico che non c'è problema. Sì, sì. Mamma mia. Ti vedi? Ah, io ti vedo. 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 Ti vedo.僕のいる世界は。ニコの生のいる世界とは違う。私は。私はどっちの世界にいるの。ここ。ずっと行ったら海。うん。海だ。
今度は今度今度っていつ今度は今度今は今今度は今度今は今From Spain, Society of the Snow, J. A. Bayona, Director. La Sociedad de la Nieve es una película que habla sobre la vida en un lugar donde no hay espacio para la vida. Esto fue una tragedia tan triste. Solamente pensá que perdés a tu madre, a tu hermana al mismo día, vivís 72 días en el peor lugar que puede vivir el ser humano. La película es como vuelta a la vida por un ratito de los que ya no están. Yo vi a mi hermano en una pantalla gigante. Todo lo que yo tenía guardado durante 50 años es gordón. Él hizo todo lo posible. Y a mí no me extraña lo que vi de Marcelo en la película, porque yo sabía cómo era él. Van a venir. La película me llevó a una realidad impresionante de lo que nosotros vivimos. De una historia muy dura, pero una historia brutal de amistad y de solidaridad y de unión. Yo era conmigo, dale. Sultano. Está bárbaro. La película está impresionante. Fueron los primeros que se acordaron que no eran 16 y que eran 29 más. Los sobrevivientes, ellos volvieron gracias a los que no volvieron. Yo como, siento que, 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 que se abrió un camino y el el cambio interior mío fue muy grande, gracias a la película. From Germany, The Teacher's Lounge, Ilker Chatak, director. Hier, schau mal. Wollte ich dir noch geben. Weißt du, was das ist? Das ist ein Zauberwürfel. Hat aber nichts mit Magie zu tun, sondern mit Mathematik. Es gibt Algorithmen, mit denen man den Würfel in 0, nichts lösen kann. Weißt du, was das ist, ein Algorithmus? Es ist eine eindeutige Handlungsabfolge, um für ein Problem eine Lösung zu finden. Mal probieren. Wenn du willst, leichen dir aus. Was muss ich denn machen? Du musst so lange drehen, bis alle Seiten eine einheitliche Farbe haben. Es wird nur schlimmer. Behalte ihn doch, bis du ihn gelöst hast. Was hältst du davon? Und wenn dich was bedrückt, dann kannst du immer mit mir reden. Das weißt du, oder? Und du kannst auch immer mit Frau Semnig reden. Sie ist ja eure Vertrauen. Warum hat meine Mama gestern geweint? Hat sie nicht mit dir darüber gesprochen? Verstehe. Haben Sie sich mit ihr gestritten? From the United Kingdom, the Zone of Interest. James Wilson, producer.
die herrliche Zeit, die mir im Gemüt im gastlichen Masurhaus verlebten. Wir gehen mit zu müssen äh, schönsten oder äh, Erinnerungen gehören. Im Osten steht unser Morgen. Habt herzlichen Dank für eure nationalsozialistische Gastfreundschaft. Und das, ich weiß nicht, Gini, Billy und das ist ein Pleasure to introduce our nominees. From Italy, Matteo Garone, Director of Io Capitano. From Japan, Bim Benders, Director, Perfect Days. From Spain, Juan Antonio Bayona, Director of Society of the Snow. From Germany, Ilke Chatak, Director of the Teacher's Lounge. And from the United Kingdom, James Wilson, producer, The Zone of Interest. Gentlemen, good evening and welcome. Uh, I want to start by acknowledging an absence. Um, that is of my cherished co-chair, uh, Susanna Beer. And this pink flower is for her because she always brings color to the stage. Uh, and clearly, we didn't get that ilk a little bit. Jim, you've got some blue. Uh, she would be in hot pink or bright green, and she is dearly missed. Um, but she's here with us because we're going to have this conversation. And Susanna and I have spent many, many hours, as have many of our members, um, thinking about, talking about, dissecting, chewing over, debating your films. Um, and she and I spoke uh, yesterday. We spoke this morning. And so I want to lead off with a question that we formulated together. Um, and it has to do with your characters um, and, and a commonality. I mean, you know, this isn't a curated selection. You all have made it through a voting process um, conducted by our members. Uh, but there are commonalities with your film. And one is in relationship to the personal conviction of your central characters. There seems to be a drive, a quite human drive, um, a determination in your characters. And, and Susanna kind of phrased it as th they want to do the right thing, even if what they end up doing may be the wrong thing. And there are various degrees of wrong <laughs> um, and the results uh, to that. But I wanted to kind of have you talk a little bit about your central characters and that drive and that ambition that they embody. And as part of your response, if you identify at all with them or with their flaws or with their, um, let's say, their, the, the positive elements of that ambition and drive. Um, Ilka, I'm going to start with you. Why are you starting with me? <laughs> <laughs> no. Um, yeah, I mean, you know, a character can only be human if he or she is flawed, right? So um, when we started writing our script, it was, there there's a saying called, um, the road to hell is paved with good intentions. And we thought that's a very interesting, yeah, way to, to, to create a character. So everything that she does in the film is, yeah, is she, she intends good, but that doesn't necessarily mean that it's the right thing to do. Um, but it's the human thing to do, and that's what matters, I think. Bim, your central character. I was just thinking. Yeah, thinking is. What th should I answer? And now you come to me. Come. <laughs> My central character has chosen the life he lives now. He lived another life that he left behind, and he has chosen to live a life of service, dedicated to the common good life where he does his best and he's strangely happy and is there anything that you identify with this i identify with his idea that if you do his if you do your best 
you know who you are. Matteo, talk to us about your boys. Oh, well, in my, in my case, the identification with uh, Sedu is uh, it's very, you know, it's very easy because it's a, a character that uh, is so human, naive. He fight for a right that should be of everybody, the right of uh, follow our dreams, the drive of move, discover, discover the world. And he fight against a system of, of that, a system where you, if you, if you try to make a journey, you risk your life. So he's a, he's a character that remain human till the end. So, um, of course, uh, I think uh, it's, it's, uh, it's difficult to don't see and, and crea create an empathy with him. I was always with him since the beginning. And it reminds me the movie that I've done before, Pinocchio, in a way. He's, uh, he's, um, he's looking for a land of toy. We, we know that sometimes and they, this young boy follow uh, a dream, an illusion. We know the background staying here, they don't know, but uh, it's, uh, it's, it's human. Like when we were young, we wanted to discover the world and they do the same. They don't understand why other people can go in you know, the easy. In their country, they, they can go outside. So I, I feel uh, since the beginning with him and probably is my in all my career is the is the, is the first time that I have a, a, a hero without dark side. In the other movie, there were always some dark side, and this case is the is the structure of uh, the journey of the hero. It's a sort of uh, yeah, um, Homeric uh, fairy tales. Juan and <laughs> Juan Antonio, you have several characters who have <laughs> incredible drive uh, and you know they they are real people who we saw some on the screen talk to us a little about about uh, finding these characters in your film we we decided to focus in one narrator I don't like to call him the protagonist because I didn't want to have a protagonist because it's a movie about the collective and about the group and that's basically the journey they discover that um, the importance of the other ones to your own survival and to understand that we are all part of the same thing. So for some of them, becoming a hero is not about saving themselves, but saving the other ones. He, we have in the center this character who is tri he's trying to do the right thing all the time, but the right thing doesn't apply in the context they live. So they he needs to find this different way of heroism in the mountain. And when he learns that, it's a self-discovery. It's, it's a journey of self-discovery, and by doing so, he's able to become part of the group, and by doing so, he somehow survives at the end. Um, Jim, I waited for you last <laughs> for a few reasons, but mostly because your central characters, the ones you created with Jonathan, um, have this incredible drive, but the results of that drive are catastrophic for the world and for everyone around. So much different ramifications. But yeah, and not obviously uh, relatable, right? Maybe one might think. Um, first of all, a quick a caveat. I'm obviously not, unlike these eminent directors, the director of the film, John Glazer, unfortunately can't be, and he's very sad that he can't be. He has a big family commitment in London today, his youngest kid's 18th birthday with a long planned birthday. So he'll be here tomorrow. So I'm afraid I'm a poor stand in for John. Not I didn't. And he wrote and directed the film. So I'm a sort of surrogate. Uh, so I'll answer as best I can for John and in, for my, in my own voice. Um, yeah, it's an interesting question, isn't it? Uh, the drive of the characters. And, and I think you mentioned the idea of relating to that and identification with that. I suppose at some way, uh, the, the entire um, uh, question of the zone of interest, or the questions of the zone of interest, uh, the thinking space that I think John 
and we were trying to um, open up. I mean, I know because we all talked about it a lot as a team. Uh, it is around the idea of relatability, which you would think at first blush you would not have with the commandant of Auschwitz and his wife, right? That would be the, the starting point um, in an extreme way. And I suppose in a way, the fundamental questions of the film are perhaps um, not about just how could these ordinary people do such terrible things, which might be the sort of banality of evil, sort of page one version of it, which is often talked about, um, which of course I think is posed by the film, but more than that, more than just how could these ordinary people do such terrible things, how like them are we? And I think that was possibly the sort of, the frame, the, the area of interest, interesting gebiet of the film um, is that it's about relatability and it's about the idea of um, trying to create as a sort of present tense feeling of of this situation, this life, this mother, mom and this mother and father raising this family in 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 a sort of high bourgeois normalcy next to Auschwitz to seek to see if we can see uh, like in some dark mirror any glimpse of ourselves in the perpetrator perspective with without us knowing what the answers are, are, but thinking that there are similarities and that the way the Holocaust is normally narrated as this sort of um, mythic, uh, almost comfortably demonized other um, is possibly not the case. And that these people, that Rudolf and Christian and people, uh, Ru Rudolf and uh, Hedwig, played by Christian Friedland, Sandra Huller, had, um, um, they had things they wanted, they had dreams and desires and things they were frightened of and things they didn't want, and that these go beyond the sort of familiar uh, or, or Nazi project of the, of the final solution, the extermination of the Jews of Europe, which encompass other things, which encompass a dream of household comfort, which, com which encompass ideas about land and labor and capital. They're involved in a business project. They're involved in a frontier project. They're pioneers. Um, they're, they're, a, they're involved in a settler colonial project. Um, we tried to seed it's not really a character thing because it's sort of in the world and the situation of the film, but we tried to seed within the lives of Rudolf and Hedwig all these little details of, of, these, of these dreams and aspirations and fears and um, that would, that were perhaps um, touch, that we could maybe see echoes of in our own lives and in, in our own histories as well, the histories of our cultures, which are built on similarly kind of um, um, ruthless uh, exploitations through hundreds of years of, uh, you know, colonial history of othered and dehumanized people in which the normalization of, uh, in which by dehumanizing other people normalizes a violence against them from which you can benefit. So, sorry if that's a bit vague, but it, it was almost like the whole question of the film is about finding these subtle, uh, touch points of rel relatability th to these drives and desires and appetites of almost like bourgeois normalcy. Um, <laughs> Ilka, I'm just going to circle back again. I'm not going to pick on you tonight, but you know, I, I'm wondering how much of yourself you introduced into these characters at all. Not not necessarily what was reflected back, but anything about your own drive that informed these characters? I'll, I'll ask each of you to, to address that, but. Um, yeah, I mean, especially when you write a film that you also direct, it's, I think, it's in inevitable that your characters and your world is also part of yourself, right? So, um, the, I mean, there are, in this story, there are many, many moments where that, that we, my, my co-writer Johannes Dunker and I just l lived like that in our time in school. We went to school together. But there's also a lot of things that, you know, um, touch on, you know, the, the being, you know, being a Turkish person in Germany or, as for him, a German person in, in Turkey because he, he grew up in, in Turkey. Um, so this, this kind of feeling of alienation or, you know, feeling 
different, not wanting to speak your own language. Um, there's a lot of things that that have made their way into the film, um, consciously or unconsciously, I would even say. Um, even things like, you know, you have a tracking shot of of the character and the way she walks. And, and I, I, I'm a person who walks fast and my DP walks fast as well. So I make sure she walks fast too because you kind of identify, you know, it's, it's, I don't know, it's, it's, it's these things that probably ha happen un unconsciously. Um, yeah, and there's a lot of that stuff. And if you dig deeper, you'll, you'll probably find a lot. Um, but yeah, I mean, but, that one scene, maybe, maybe that's a story to tell, where the whole class is um, screaming. That was a moment that we had in in our time in school. It was one day after 9/11, yeah. and our English teacher came into class and he was like, "Can we please all, all stand up? You, do, are you, do you see what's going on in the world?" We we well, we all said yes, and he said, "Please stand up. Let's let's just scream." And these kind of memories, they when you write a story and when you write a a film you you know they they come back and that's why i always think that filmmaking is also kind of a way of self therapy you know you 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 make a film and you learn something about the world but you also learn something about yourself and th the stuff that that comes back is just unexpected at times vim yeah thank you Knowing you a bit, Vim, and knowing your work, and in your central character, I really plugged in, or let's say I put you into especially his spirituality, which is related to things he sees in the world, and it's kind of what you described and elevating, but on a more superficial level, I mean, this guy has the best taste in music, and so do you. How much of him is you? Well, I like his musical taste. <laughs> but as Ilka said, sometimes you make movies to learn something. Mm. And my guy, Hirayama, lives with two principles that I'm very tempted to learn much more about. One is reduction. He lives with very little. And even he has little, he's very happy with it. And that is a dream of mine, because I'm a collector. I collected everything, not just music, but books and stones and anything from all over the world. So the idea of having less and less and less is very tempting to me. And I learned a lot from this man so far that I realized you can make a movie about a man who has almost nothing and is happy with the little he has. You can make a movie and use all these means. You can have the dolly and the track and the steady cam and the gimbal and and crane. You just take also what is the minimal means to make a movie, which is a man with a camera on his shoulder. So we shot the film as if we had incorporated the idea of reduction. Mm -hmm. And the other thing I wanted to learn more from my character was to live in the now and here, which is such a great idea for everybody today because we know that less and less and our time is stolen so much from us and to live in the now is a blessing also a spiritual blessing and Hirayama succeeds in that and I wanted to see this character and have him in front of me and learn more from him about that as well. Juan Antonio, anything as Vim that you learned from your characters, or is there something that if we really looked hard, it's like, aha, that's Juan Antonio? Yeah, I, um, I can feel related to Numa, the central character. He's like a good guy who tries to do the right thing all the time. Um, but the right thing is not the same in the mountain than home. But he doesn't understand that. So the more he tries, the more the mountain is stopping him, forcing him to discover a different nature that is who he really is. It's about breaking 
with the other ones and accepting who you are and be brave enough to be that. To me, that was very important when I did the film. I learned a lot working with these people. I had the luxury to work with the people who, who live the same experiences uh, than Numa. And it's very interesting when you, when you find these people, it's like, I remember this, this, this idea that er everybody has the same chance doesn't matter if we if we are from Germany or Spain or or if you're rich or poor, we have the one one chance, the chance of living. But this guy had two chances. And by when you are in front of that, you you suddenly have a more extreme idea of how lucky you are. And that was something that was part of the process all the time. Mateo, I know you share a love for football with your, <laughs> your lead actors, but anything else that you, when you were talking then, because uh, Seydoux is not an actor before this, and so how did you talk to him about creating this character? Any, and, and it was any of it from like, from you? We, we didn't talk uh, because um, I shoot, I shoot uh, the movie in, uh, in chronological way. So he lived the, the journey of the character day by day without know about the, how it uh, will be ending the, is, is the story of his character. Uh, I never gave the script mm. to him. And he didn't ask to me <laughs> the, the script, <laughs> and so um, uh, yeah, um, uh, I I always try to create a sort of wedding within the character and the person. So I I try to help the actor um, putting something of his uh, personal life, like for instance, in this case, uh, the fact that he loves to sing. It was not in the script, but um, we put in the in the character, and uh, and so that's I think help, and also shooting chronologic way is uh, it's very important, especially when uh, when they um, there are actors that don't have a, an academic background, and about this uh, come up in my mind. Uh, things that they do said a few weeks ago, I was talking before about that, uh, in a Q&A, and I didn't know, we've been making Q&A for months, but I didn't know about this. And uh, he, they, they asked to him how he prepared to make the last shot, the last shot of the movie that was incredible, close up, four minutes. And, and he said that um, for sure the fact that there were many people shouting his name, that he caught uh, all this help him. But also he was uh, saying, when he was saying, Io Capitano, he was saying that he succeed because he succeed on make the movie. Because he was so afraid at the beginning, because it was the first time in his life that was acting. And he was the main actor in a big movie. And the mother and the sister forced him to make the movie. And uh, he wanted to be a soccer player, so he was uh, he couldn't say no, but he was terrified by the, the this. Uh, so when he was shouting and crying and r smiling, everything at the end, he was say, "Io capitano," he was say, I, "I I I did it, I made it, I succeeded." So another um, commonality uh, is this strong cross-cultural thread uh, amongst all of the five films that have been nominated. Um, some of you are working outside of your home country and language. <laughs> some, are, some of you, your films are addressing difference within a society. Um, I'd love for you to talk about the challenge or maybe the liberation of this. And Vim, I will start with you. Um, I will note that last night, 
I believe it was last night, um, you were awarded uh, Best Director at the Japanese equivalent of their Academy Awards, their Top Film Awards, and you were the first non-Japanese person to win this award. Thank you. And nothing could feel more natural than Perfect Days as a Vim Vendors film, but yet it is a Japanese film. Or yeah, and I'm a Japanese director now. <laughs> Even when I came in, the voice said, from Japan, Vim Vendors. It, which is strangely true, because when I came there for the very first time in a long time ago, in 1977, I was there for the first time and I felt strangely at home. It took me a long time to understand it, why, understand why it might take too long to tell it here, but it was all, I've always felt welcome and I always felt good in Japan. And there was something I loved and I think I was able to finally get it out with this film, Perfect Days. And by choice, we didn't have our actor talk so much because I felt it was better if he not talked so much or so didn't have a problem of asking my co-writer is that good or not so he speaks little and and uh, I had for the first time this unbelievable feeling that my actor had completely become the part I did not know this feeling before. There was always, I mean, I made documentaries and fiction, and there was always intertwined, but in the fictional film, I was always aware of the fictional aspect of it. And in this case, my Japanese actor became so much this serviceman that together with my DOP, Franz is somewhere here in the room. Franz, yeah? So, there you are. We realized we should react, and and then we asked him, Koji, can we? Sh we always shoot. We always rehearse, and then we shoot. And then I always regret that we didn't shoot the rehearsal. The next scene, could we shoot right away? And he was very surprised. Japanese actors don't normally do that. So we shot the rehearsal, and I said, "Fantastic, let's move on." And he was a little bit amazed and from there on we more and more did this unbelievable journey of following the man as if he was a documentary character and in a documentary you never rehearse i mean that's the worst thing you can do and so we shot the film more and more like a documentary and that was such a blessing i felt and it was so liberating because i had to I don't know, make so many movies and become so old in order to finally live that bliss. And so, why am I telling you that? Is that an answer? Uh, absolutely. <laughs> Juan Antonio, you tell a story that, I mean, it's, it's known, it has been translated in cinema even before, but it's a, it is a Uruguayan story, right? This is a heroic um uh, tragic as well, of course, but it's, it, and you're translating this with, collaborating with survivors. Talk to us about taking this national story and, and making it yours. Yeah, I remember that reading um, Pablo Bierce's book is the first time that the story is told from a Uruguayan perspective, from a Uruguayan author. Also, a friend of them, so he knew all of them since he was a kid. So there is this sense of, this knowledge, this sense of intimacy with them. And I remember there was a, a moment in, in, in the book that I was very impressed. Um, when they came back, they, they were forced to do a press conference to tell the world what they did. And one of them was ready to, to explain the audience and, and five minutes before getting into the stage, he was so nervous he couldn't talk. And there was one of the teachers from the school they were coming from, asking what, what's going on, and he said, I'm, I'm, I, I'm too nervous, I, I, I don't know how to say it, I don't know how to tell what we did. 
And the teacher said, just explain the context, and by doing so, they will understand everything. And to me, that was probably the best lesson, how to do this film. So I had to explain the context. Impossible to shoot this film in a different language than Uruguayan Spanish. We had to shoot in the same, almost the same locations in the, in the catching the reality. We went to the mountain, we spent days there to understand how was the mountain. Um, and we tried to understand how were the lives of these people before getting into that plane, you know, like, like their social life, the songs they were listening to. And then we explained the, 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 the reality of that mountain shooting in, 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 in sequence also in real locations facing uh, the cold, the hunger, all those real emotions that we were fortunate to capture with the camera. I tried to explain the context, you know, that's basically what I, what I did. That was the, my guiding light, just make the audience go through the same journey. I took the actors and they were brave enough to, to follow that same journey in sequence. And hopefully by doing so, people will understand what, what they did there. I want to uh, expand this question a little bit to the question of national representation as well, right? You're all sitting here representing um, a nation that chose your film to represent them uh, at the, the Academy Awards. Um, Jim, I wonder if you could speak a little bit about your, your Polish collaborators. I know you had a, a Polish co-producer. The film was shot in Poland um, in German, um, but maybe just talk through that process. Um, Sure, yeah. Well, actually, uh, a Polish, uh, uh, my, my producer partner, not co-producer, uh, Eva Puczynska, I think might be in the audience somewhere, produced the film with me, and also yeah, a Polish co-producer, Bartek Wainski, who I think is also here. Um, um, yeah, it couldn't have been done without them. The Well, it's a simple answer, really. Um, there was never any question um, that John would not make the film in Poland because it happened in Poland. I suppose, in, in a sense, a bit like what you're saying about Society of the Snow, there was never any question for him, for me, for us, that it would not be in its native languages because that's what was spoken. And without being sort of obsessive or, uh, about it, it was just like the whole... <laughs> Even if it wasn't the conceit of the film, I can't really imagine John making a film. You know, there was never a moment where he was going to do that convention of uh, English or American actors speaking, uh, you know, you pretending it's German like in an old World War II movie or even some modern ones, right? Or German actors speaking uh, accented English, which is kind of bizarre as well. Because, yeah, it goes back to the first question, I suppose, for me, which is the whole idea was to just have this kind of immersive present tense you know it's happening so uh with poland yeah we were going to make it in poland and he wanted to make it where it happened in auschwitz and that's where we did it next next with the whole set was made next right next to auschwitz um so you're really watching them there um and had to work up, so i knew early on that we would have to work with uh, i would need to work with the polish collaborators um early on we started working with uh, bartek uh, who's a friend of john's uh, bartek renski and he organized all the research there which went on up for several years it took a long time to um, it was a research-based script working with the Auschwitz Museum. And then when we had a script after about three or four years of development and writing, maybe four years, um, I, I knew we had to, I had to work with a top Polish producer and I knew through, um, um, through some connections, um, Pavel Pawlikowski, I know Pavel a little bit, and I knew his British producer, Tanya Sagacian, and I reached out to Ava because she's uh, produced uh, Cold War and Ida, uh, Pavel Pavlikovsky's amazing films. Ida won 
Oscar Cold War was nominated. Um, and uh, luckily for me, Ava um, was interested in the project and we sent her the script and then we started working. And yeah, well, the, the entire, every day of the film was shot in Poland. So it's, uh, yeah, absolutely a complete uh, symbiotic uh, relationship to its Polishness in terms of the shooting of the film um, at every level. Yeah. I want, I want to um, move to the, the question of community and, and the global community, but Ilka, I want to give you an opportunity to, to have a word on this concept of national representation because, and, and again, if you don't, <laughs> you don't want to speak to this, but I, I have noticed that you have um, made it your mission to have Germany say your name in God. relationship to this nomination. And, and I actually think it's, it's really powerful. Um. I mean, I, th I think a lot of people don't know what you're talking about, so should I just elaborate on, on, if, if, on if the you'd topic? If you'd like to. Oh, man. Okay. <laughs> oh, really? Um, well, okay. So, uh, how, how do I put this? So, there's this scientific, scientifically proven thing that, you know, um, when you have two students who are the same... Who, who who have who are same uh, equally good, and the one's name is Max and the second's name is Murat, in Germany, then Max will always get the better grades. Okay, so it's important that the ear gets used to the name of Murat, and in the media coverage in Germany, we unfortunately had um, we had Sandra Huller, Wim Wenders, and others, and. You know, that wasn't just one newspaper, it was so many, and they, they, they just didn't write the name, right? And I thought a lot about that, and I didn't want to make it about myself, but then I thought, oh no, I, I actually have the spotlight right now, and I'm, I'm going to take that responsibility in the name of others and say something about it. And then I posted some stuff on Instagram, and, <laughs> and all, all of a sudden I found myself in the eye of the storm and the whole country was like trying to speak to me about it and i and i and i spoke what, what was on my mind i said you know you got to say our names i mean they aren't german typically german names but i am german and it's important that the german ear gets used to it because you know other, if if we don't say the names then the the ear will not get used to it and the injustice will continue so that was last week um but <laughs> for those who, <laughs> and um, and I want to say something about the zone of interest because just you know, um, I would have loved a film like that to be made by a German director. Not that it's like any less good, um, but but the the narrative of German films about the Holocaust is so oftentimes like not all of us were Nazis, right? And um, I, I, I thought this is, just, this is just a great example of, you know, of how it could have been. And um, I think, you know, I love Germany and I live, live, love living there and that's why I criticize the country. What I, and, 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 and so do I with Turkey because I also feel very connected with Turkey. So. Um, that is something that, you know, um, yeah, it's, it's something where I, for instance, also like 8 of May is, is the day of liberation. Um, Richard von Weizsäcker, um, former German president, he, he introduced that, that day of liberation. And that, of course, is suggesting as if all Germans were, um, had to be liberated from, from, from not, as if there weren't any Nazis and they had to be liberated, right? So this narrative has, has turned and you can also see that in films. So that's why, I, why, why you know, okay, now this has gotten something <laughs> so political. I'm so sorry. I, no, I, no, 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 no. Yeah, yeah. No, look, as... as uh, I'm so... I'm, yeah. No. Uh, it, it's taken courage and I think it's, a, it's an amazing example of using the spotlight of your Oscar nomination to actually manifest something really important. And, and I, I elevated it because I'm a guy named Rajendra Roy who was raised in the US 
and was asked constantly in the 70s, uh, where are you from? So. And, and, I, and I gave the example of the Academy, which I thought was incredible because I got an email from the Academy saying, could you please send us an audio file how to pronounce your name? And this is something that I would expect to have you know, in Germany as well. So I do want to pivot to um, this tradition. Um, for those of you who have been attending these panels for the past three years at least, and since Susanna and I have done it, um, we have this um, idea that we like everyone on stage together, right? You, you are representing a global community of filmmakers. Um, it's, it's five of you on stage. It's 88 uh, filmmakers who were part of this, and you know that, that turns into thousands and thousands of people filmmakers who are, are contributing to all of these incredible works that we can consider. Um, and I was wondering if you could each say a few things about um, one of the other filmmakers on the stage and, and kind of like celebrate a little bit um, what you all have done. Ilka, you started. Um, would you like to say a few other things about um, the zone of interest? Yeah, my pleasure. I mean... <laughs> 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 yes. Like no, one of those uh, reality shows. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, the the what when I saw the film, I thought you're tackling a topic that has been, you know, there ha there have been so many films about it, and 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 you make this film where every formal decision becomes a matter of an ethic question, an ethical question. Because you don't want to glamorize those people, and you don't, you know, you don't want to show them in the in the wrong way, and I w I thought about this film, and I thought, you know, when you when you have to think about every decision you make formally, it becomes like a philosophical journey making a film. Really, just what does it mean to put the camera there, not to go any detail, not not to do close-ups, not to pan, you know. It's such a film that is so meticulously well and precisely crafted that, you know, I was just in awe. And um, I, 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 yeah, it, it, it's just an incredible, incredible accomplishment, really. I, thank you. I, I really, it's a, such a pity John's not here because um, I think he would respond to that because every decision about the form of the film, I don't know if there can be crosstalk in this thing, was it was it was about that. It was to use the tools of cinema, of cinematography, uh, visual effects, um, uh, the style of the acting, the production design, where everything is new to just create this formal sense of present tenseness and observation of that that was sort of almost authorless, uh, that didn't have the kind of fetishized paraphernalia of film language in order to create a, a hoped for end of a sort of blank mirror that might reflect us. So how you articulated was the aim. I don't know if it succeeded. Maybe for you it, it seems like it. Yeah, yeah I, and I mean also also y when you think about what, what is cinema, right? What, what is cinema? Every, I think everybody has, a, has their own definition, but to me cinema is, is a space that is left to me to make up my own mind. And by just not showing things, you force me to make up my mind, and it's just cinema, purest, cinema at its purest, I would say. Thank you, guys. Vim, you tell us some thoughts about the Teacher's Lounge. I love that movie, and I'm pretty proud to sit here with all you guys because I think we represent five very different but five great movies. Teacher's Lounge is a film set in a microcosm that you all know. You know two microcosms in your life, the family, it's private, and school. That's the first time you live society. This film takes place only in a school. The entire outside world is outside. There's a class, seventh grade, a young teacher, ambitious. She wants to do the best. There's theft in the class. There's suspicions, and suspicions are always the first poison in society. She tries to do her best in order to save, her, save the children from racial profiling. There's theft also in the teacher's lounge among the, among the teachers. 
she tries to do her best again to solve that and she has a very bad idea to put up her computer and let it run while they're all gone because maybe the thief would show up there. And then all hell breaks loose. And that little school becomes such a great model for society. And these children in your film are extraordinary. And the teacher is extraordinary. Some of the kids are here. I wish I could see them so you can give a great hand to them. Where are you? These, these guys are fantastic. And Leonie is also there, the unbelievable teacher. There. Leonie. So, I won't spoil the film because some of you might have seen it. But <laughs> I tell you, all hell is breaking loose. And this is a great thriller set in one location. Thank you. Thank you, Vim. Matteo. Some thoughts, feelings about Society of the Snow. Well, I'm... Before I was talking with Antonio, uh, we, we, um, we share the same uh, approach that is, uh, is visual. And I think the, the movie is, uh, is an experience, emotional experience. So um, you live in, uh, in subjective, the, the journey of this character. And, and so it's, it's a movie that you have to feel you know, from inside. And it's, um, again, it's very visual. So I, I felt that there is something in common with, with also my, my work, my Io Capitano. It is the same, it's trying to give to the audience the possibility to, to live an experience in subjective. So I'm, I love, then I, I, I can be more deep because I'm not a, a critic, <laughs> but uh, yeah, I, I think, uh, I, I, had, I had something clever to say about Zone of Interest, but <laughs> I, <laughs> yes, <laughs> Go for I it. couldn't Go say. Elka went first. You I mean, I, I, no, but it's not so clever, but <laughs> a little bit. But it's, it's, it's about, I always said that your Capitano is a reverse shot, you know? You, you see uh, something that you no one see because you see only the last part of the journey. So finally you have a, a reverse shot and see the other side. And Zona Vincent is also a reverse shot. It's the opposite. You see something, instead of being inside, you see for the first time something that happened outside. So there are two reverse shots, of one from outside and the other from inside. I don't know if it's, it's intelligent or not, but... <laughs> All <it's> those things. <laughs> and generous, thank you. But so. Juan Antonio, talk to us about Io Capitano. Say something very simple. No, I have something. <laughs> I have something about Son of Interest, too. <laughs> <laughs> few words, then, only few words. No, I, I remember uh, in, in one of the scenes in our film, uh, sorry to talk about my film, but I will talk about your film, <laughs> because we have something in common. I, uh, th there is the, that moment of the avalanche, and the characters had, the real people there, had these near-death experiences where they saw themselves from the outside of their bodies, you know, like this kind of experiences they had. And I, one of them told me, um, reality was not enough, only dreaming was able to explain what we went through. But by doing so, it, they were like talking about movies, sometimes movies explain reality, explain the truth better than reality. And there is, um, it's, it's very interesting how Matteo uh, talk about Pinocchio, because uh, I, I saw there's a lot of elements with uh, fairy tales. The fact that you have uh, a couple of kids in the center with a very long journey, a journey of discovery of the world and discovery of, of themselves. The fact that they are dealing with primal fears the most important one, the fear to death, but also the fear of starvation, the fear of being abandoned, the fear of being alone, you know? And this idea of the journey 
and the way Matteo looks at the characters always at the same level, never from above, you know. I, I come from a working class neighborhood and, and it was a very marginal neighborhood. I live in the 80s, all the problems of the drugs. And, but if, they, if you ask me about my life in my neighborhood, it was a very happy childhood. I was, I was very protected by my parents. I was lucky enough not to have those kind of problems in my family. And when I see the approach of Matteo, it's like that. He's looking at the characters always at the, at the level of their eyes. They, they don't see themselves as miser in misery. They see themselves as heroes. And he has this beautiful last shot that is full of life, the ending of the journey, and it's about pride. Pride of who these people, who they are. That's not Jim? fair, huh? No, no. <laughs> it's not fair. They're not, they're not going to play us off, Jim. You can please talk to us. Walk down here. It's got 40 seconds. No, no. This isn't the Oscars yet. Uh, I'm, but I'm not known for my uh, concision. Is that true? <laughs> talk to us about perfect days. Um, well, 28 seconds. It's very oh, off-putting. Um, I, um, I don't know if, if, if it's appropriate. I had a very... Uh, sorry? <laughs> Reduction is the whole idea. <laughs> yeah, haiku. Yeah, yeah. I was, I was thinking about it. It's a haiku. Um, I had a very personal uh, reaction to um, uh, Perfect Days, which I've seen twice and uh, loved. And I don't know if it's appropriate to talk about it in that way because it's very yeah. good. But although the personal re re reaction was in relation to Vim's. Uh, other films of Vim's, his, his, which were very important in m my life, uh, of my generation. And I can speak for John, actually, because we're exactly the same age. So we 58. Um, well, he actually is 59. Um, I'm a few months. And so I grew up uh, in terms of my own sort of cinephilia. Uh, it was the New German cinema and, and the films of Vim in the, in the uh, late 70s. You know, that was my late 70s and, sp and the 80s. Alice in the Cities, Kings of the Road, uh, Paris, Texas. I saw Paris, Texas five nights in a row in London at the, uh, every, and then The Wings of Desire, which sort of changed my life. And I was obsessed with two figures at the time, Nick Cave, who I then went on to make a couple of films with, and Nastasia Kinski. So, you know, in Paris, Texas and, and uh, Wings of Desire. And then I was also had a relationship with Japan, a country I've never been to through film, uh, through, Chris Marker's uh, um, masterpiece, Sans Soleil, which is a film I've taken with me all my life and inspires me. And Vim made a film called Tokyo Ga in the early 80s that was, a, 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 I feel, is in dialogue with Perfect Days, which is a film about Japan and the, the, the Tokyo scene in, the, in Ozu films, but also Chris Marker is in. And I felt Perfect Days, uh, although it's lovely to hear you talk about it in terms of this um, uh, almost sort of Buddha, you know, living in the now sort of spiritual thing. And, it, and that is so strong in the film and the kind of smelling the roses and the details and light and coming through trees and all these beautiful things. Um, and in that sense, it is a haiku. It's a sort of distillation. But I th maybe that is the definition of a haiku because in those three lines and whatever syllables, I just thought there was this world of cinematic memory and dialogue with other, both other films and other art, um, the, the books, the music that kind of sent you off. I was like Googling the name of the Japanese writer and it was like a film that had its own uh, sort of footnotes, its sort of compendium, like a reading list. I love that idea. So it felt like both this sort of beautifully distilled cinematic haiku completely dense and, and having all these capillaries that went off into all these other sort of memories of, of, of films and uh, relationships that are often in your films about <coughs> um, sort of slightly uh, isolated figures who have kind of lost themselves from their families, daughters, um, sons, um, nephews, nieces in this case, sisters, and uh, 
kind of running through your work and it just felt like they were all sort of beautifully distilled in this haiku uh, simplicity and I just found it utterly transporting and kind of inspiring um, of how a film could talk about um, such simple things but also talk about uh, a, a history of cinema. Thank you, Jim. I also could talk for hours and hours about Vim Benders, and I have, but look, I think um, I want to thank you on behalf of, of Susanna, uh, on behalf of our, our voters, uh, for your work and for your generosity um, in sharing your work, but sharing this evening with us, speaking about it, creating this community, and perpetuating it. Um, we, we uh, an academy, rely on all of that um, for our progress in the future. And if we are in your hands, we're in very good hands indeed. Our Oscar nominees. Thank you all. Enjoy the show on Sunday. <laughs>